And we're live. We're going to go through the tactical intellect with Shannon here, Jeff, and Sana a little bit. So uh, let's focus on this uh, screen. Um, Jeff, do you want to read this out? <laughs> no. Oh, stop. Okay, I'll read it out and uh, we we'll usually alternate paragraphs. I'll read it out and then you can stop me. Anything which comes to mind. When artis what artisans do most and best is work on their immediate environs in a tactical way. Tactics is the art of making moves to better one's position in the here and now. Whether those moves are dabbing oils on canvas, flying in rough weather, dishing off the basketball on a fast break or skirmishing on the battlefield. Indeed, SP battle leaders are no different from SP painters, pilots or point guards. They're always scanning for opportunities always looking for the best angle of approach and so are able to come up with that particular action which at the moment gives them the greatest advantage and brings success. Robert E. Lee, George Patton and Erwin Ir Rommel were all brilliant SP tactical leaders. Able to know... Is that enough power sensing for you, Sana? <laughs> His warriors. Um, able to notice the smallest details in their immediate surroundings. The slightest changes in both foreground and background, which allowed them to grasp the moment and to exploit fully whatever resources were at hand. With their ear to the ground and their finger on the pulse of battle, they could spot an opening, sniff out an opportunity and taste a victory. So, Shannon, are you anything like that? Or do you wish to be like that? Or <laughs> I, I think that I am like that. Like thinking of traffic if I see an opening and I'm going to take it and I know I have enough room <laughs> wow. even so how do you th how does that urge there to sort of like take risks sort of combine with the way you see yourself as Enneagram type six which is uh, usually associated with someone being careful and worried and anxious hmm well when you talk about like there's a phobic and counterphobic types. Um, wow. I think I'm a little bit of both actually. I'm a little bit of a risk taker and I'm a little bit of uh, the opposite, yeah. just depends. But when it comes to like the environment, I kind of make a game out of it. Yeah. Like with, with dance and spatial awareness, like I love that I know something is going to fit just perfectly without measuring that type of thing. Right. So what are the kind of things that, that you would get anxious over where you're six? Cause I think Tom Condon, I think Tom Condon might be an SP. I know he's a six. He might be an SP. Cause I heard uh, that he would like, jump, jump onto the back onto trains as they passed by a bridge just like really counterphobic moments <laughs> with tom i have some of those experiences jumping on the back of an ice cream truck <laughs> wow you got serious sp points details please <laughs> when i was a child the, the ice cream truck that would go by uh in our neighborhood i would be the first one to jump on the back of it and go for a ride wow <laughs> I jumped and then off jump a roof. Off and not get hurt. Oh, you jumped off a roof? Yeah. <laughs> and I did get hurt, but I didn't but I didn't die. <laughs> H hence my state of aliveness now. Yes. <laughs> Evidently. <laughs> Another time I tried to jump over a campfire and instead I jumped into the campfire. Wow. And Another time I walked through a glass door. <laughs> that was fun. Uh oh. That well, was actually it, yeah. in the house. Um, and so that uh that door remained uh remained with the glass busted out of it for the rest of the time we were there. I remember Jeff, you did a video about SPs being extreme and you're sort of poking fun at the stereotype. Mm -hmm. of the extreme stuff so um and, and one of the 
one of the one of the many great things you've said is about how the SP temperament can come through in little ways um, where their environment might not allow them to fully express themselves but there's always like a little thing where it can come through um, and I think you've said you that in your place of work you do some something similar will come through every now and then a little little bit of the art what you can get away with um, do you think that's part of the artisan mindset always looking for something they can get away with yeah um, I think uh, recently I was reminded of a story that I heard about Madonna when she was a little girl and was in dance classes that her mother signed her up for or whatever so at first she didn't really want to be there um, and she said that uh, she would like rip up her dance uniform and then put it back together with safety pins and would wear like different color ribbons and things in her hair that you know that they like weren't officially approved of parts of the uniform because she was like well I'm showing up to this thing but I'm gonna like stand out and do my own thing I'm not gonna conform to uh, what everybody else is doing so that's just one example but so it's just like yeah there's a lot of little things that you know can be done to like express oneself without uh, without like being super extreme about it Interesting. Did you do little things like that, Shannon, or just doing the extreme stuff? Um, I do have some contrarian tendencies. Like, I have a very large tattoo on my arm and has an upside down cross on it, and I did it to piss people off. <laughs> <laughs> And then for those that have a really hard time with it, I say that it's the St. Anthony's cross. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. That might be a little bit of the accommodating things. <laughs> it's yeah, like SP, yeah. but then also accommodating. <laughs> what? Jeff told me a story about SJs now, SJ kids now getting a tattoo. Do you want to tell that story <laughs> again, Jeff? I don't about... know what you're referring to. About the SJ, the SJ kid got a tattoo, and then he had something like about the loving their parents on the tattoo, something like that. Rather than so, because it had become normal. So whenever the SJs are doing it, you know, it's yeah, when, when it's, it's cool no longer course. a rebellious thing, right? <laughs> when I was a kid, like the only people who had tattoos were like you know bikers and heavy metal people and military and stuff like that so it was still seen as this like rebellious thing now for whatever reason in the last like decade or so it's like tattoos popularity became so extreme like i mean became so mainstream that uh like it's not a big deal anymore to most people so it's no longer something that's rebellious to most people now it's sort of like the opposite like you're a rebel if you don't do that yeah. So, uh, you know. so I remain tattoo free. <laughs> you rebel, you rebel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here we go. That this wasn't something I ever wanted, though. Even when I was a kid, it didn't appeal to me. So, yeah. Um, I mean, maybe like the temporary rub on tattoo things, but I never was like, you know what? I'd like to get myself permanently scarred. That would be awesome. <laughs> that that never really popped into my head. I've got to say, Shannon, you've got an impressive television behind you. How big is that thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's 55 inches. Ooh. Or 60. Oh. That's, <laughs> That's the thought. INFJ, the INFJ's choice. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> um... Tactical intelligence, however, need not be confined to the gym, the cockpit, the art studio, or the battlefield. Artisans are the great performers. Uh, got there, next one. Anyway. Such as Judy Garland, Louis Armstrong, Marlon Brando, Bob Hope, and Gene Kelly. They also make gifted business and political leaders. John DeLorean, Rupert Murdoch. I think Rupert Murdoch, ESTP. What do you think, Jeff? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. For example, uh, and Winston Churchill, yeah. He, he frequently gets cited as an Enneagram 8, Winston Churchill. Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt, uh, John F. Kennedy. Somebody said about John F. Kennedy, the worst thing you can do to him is bore him. Uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, moreover, the artisan's keen perception makes them the natural scroungers or foragers among the four temperaments. Those with an uncanny ability to locate any and all available resources and to turn some sort of profit on them. Uh, films such as Stalag 13, The Great Escape and Empire of the Sun depict the incredible skill of artisan scroungers as prisoners of war. Uh, did, any comments on that, Jeff? Um, well, it just reminded me, did you watch that interview I linked you to with Howie Mandel? No, I'm afraid I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not where I just watched the interview. It occurred to me that he would probably fit in that list as well. As I related to a lot of stuff he said, but you know, he was like, he was talking about how people thought he was weird growing up because he wanted to be the center of attention. And he was like, I I thought it was weird that everybody else didn't want to. So, but he was saying like the greatest thrill for him was like he did this. Uh, comedy performance in the round he kept focusing on that was in the round so he's like surrounded by his audience so it was like yeah. the greatest thing ever because he's like i can't turn around and like escape from the audience they're everywhere around me so i'm like you know that's like when it's just me and there's nobody else to uh to um to carry anything it's just all the attention is on me and i have to do something with it and everybody around me and there's no escape You've been on stage before, Jeff. Would you actually prefer that, it's like having to like change it and move so the different parts of the audience can see? Yes and no. Like I've thought about that. Like there are some things that would that would appeal to me about that, but then there's other. It depends on what kind of performance it was. Like if it, like what he was talking about, like a comedy performance like that. Yeah, that sounds like it'd be, probably be fun. If it was like a play or something, then that would be a little more difficult because then when you're trying to act as a character unless the particular character is somebody that's really kind of like frantic and always like moving around a lot or turning around a lot, then it would be difficult, more difficult anyway, to act to a audience that was all around you, I think. Do you think that you would like make a feature of the fact that you'd like turn it around so that <laughs> other parts of the audience can see? I mean, it could, it could be done. I mean, if you think yeah. about a TV show where you've got, um, you know, say somebody uh, who they're, they're, talk you know they're going walking in one direction like talking to somebody and then they turn around and go the other way yeah. like you could kind of do it that way but it's sort of like you know watching a football game where you know if all the action is on one end of the field then uh, the other side starts to get a little bored but mm. so you get you'd have to be able to mix it up some right then. could be an interesting challenge does any of that ring true for you shannon like any yeah right. yeah the the scrounging and foraging yeah like apocalyptic post-apocalyptic world i would find whatever we needed to survive i'm on it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i bet some sps might be thinking oh it wouldn't be so bad if <laughs> that situation i could come to the fore yeah, I've always said, like, it's not, I, I enjoy the the luxuries I have in my life, um, so I don't take them for granted. However, if you were to just, like, drop me in the wilderness somewhere and tell me how to survive, I always said, I think I would probably, like, drop to the ground and cry for, like, 20 minutes, but then I would get over it and get on with, like, you know, figuring what uh, what to do from there. So it's like my initial reaction would not be... I turn into some kind of super ninja warrior or something. <laughs> I would, I, I would, I would probably say this sucks in every way imaginable for for a little while. But then after I had my good cry and tantrum about it, then I'd be like, "All right, now what do I do?" And then I'd start figuring it out. So. Do you think you, Morgan might enjoy it even more than you? Probably. <laughs> but I think I could get into it. I mean, if the two of us were together, I know I could because we obviously would. I mean, for me, it's like it makes anything better having other people around. I don't have like a, a particular. Um, I don't get a thrill out of like, oh, I'm going to solve everything myself with no with mm. no help or no uh, no companionship. I like companionship, so 
it would make it better to have people with me as long as those people could get with the program if you know what i mean like yeah <laughs> like could do be doing the same thing in terms of the foraging and whatever you know look, yeah doing the doing that as opposed to like being with people that were just going to whine and complain the whole time so i suppose it, and if you did solve stuff you'd want everybody to see the awesome solutions well yeah but um that in itself is not super important to me like i'm no. fine with um i think you know istps have always said are like the most yeah stubborn or the most unwilling to to do other people's ideas i feel like i'm a little bit more open to yeah. letting somebody else come up with an idea than that but um but yeah it's fun if i can solve things myself well i mean i mean what, what i sort of mean is like if if it's impressive to them yeah because it's like the attention from other people uh yeah um I suppose, I suppose a, a running joke could be through this hangout where I go, is that enough power sensor for you, Santa? <laughs> like at certain points. <laughs> right, but not quite yet. Time to say that. Um, maybe when we get to the ESTP section. You already did say it. I know. And Jeff doesn't like Twice. repetition. Yes. I won't say it again. I don't like uh, repetition. Where did that come from? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Vague memories. Uh <laughs> I might even be making it up. I don't know. Hey, um, hey, hey, Jeff, remember that story about the duck? Uh, <laughs> tell that story. What? I don't remember that. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. I remember Flustered and Flanners, but I don't remember the duck. <laughs> I remember the yeah, story. Because of... I just made that up, Ben. That would be why. <laughs> yes, because I know that. I was that. trying to recreate the sensation of, of you asking me to tell a story that I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yes, I, I know, I know, I because I would have, if it was, if you had told a duck story, it would have been awesome and I would have remembered it. <laughs> Just like your brother and the guy with the Doritos in the backpack. Well, I mean, who could forget that one? I mean, that's... Well, is, Shannon, have you heard that story about the... about <laughs> really Jeff? not much to it. Oh, go on there, Jeff. Please tell it. <laughs> All there is to it is I was walking with my brother uh, on the Texas A&M campus or close to it on our way there, probably either to go to the library or to the computer lab, because in those days, kids, everybody didn't have like internet at the touch of their fingers. We had to like walk to a computer place in the basement of a building on a, on a university campus in order to access the internet. And we were on our way to do that probably <laughs> When this guy on roller skates or rollerblades or whatever with a backpack that was like half open with a big bag of Doritos sticking out of it just sort of skates up to us and says to my brother, a little more age and body mass and the all black outfit will be believable. And then he skated off because <laughs> my brother was wearing an all black outfit in case that was I, mean, I mean if you're gonna write a sitcom jeff that guy on the <laughs> sitcom character that's well yeah <laughs> all right then i also like the flustered and flannery story but um all right we've got here but whether on the battlefield, well, that, I mean, that's Andrew. another example. The Flusher and Flannery is another example yeah. of, what, of that whole like um, finding little ways to express yourself thing. Yeah. So, because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. There wasn't anybody like, oh, this guy's so edgy or whatever. It was just well, a fun thing to do. So, well, if you, if you tell the story again, then the audience will know what, what we mean <laughs> about this legendary. Well, again, not a whole lot to it, but because uh. the whole thing is it's about little things you can do just to you know break the boredom so when i you know i was working in a uh a restaurant where you know i had to ask the customers questions as i went down the line making their sandwich and uh, this was in a in a mall food court so the acoustics are really bad and you can't hear somebody right in front of you or at least not very well because it's too loud and all the noise is bouncing off everything uh, so after, you know, like hours and hours of this, you know, start to get bored with asking the same questions over and over again. And I, you know, realized that, you know, when people couldn't hear me much anyway, uh, it didn't matter if I said the exact 
names of things correctly uh, as long as they got the gist of what I was asking. So just one example was instead of asking mustard or mayonnaise, I could say flustered or flannays, and they would hear enough of the word to know what I was asking and just answer me as if I had said mustard or mayonnaise. So, <laughs> so did yeah, you start to like play that. with it to see how far you could go <laughs> remote yeah, away from and, the world? <laughs> and there was a dude I worked with who he, he was fond of like, he would start off people with, different questions like what flavor hot dog would you like we didn't serve hot dogs so it was like <laughs> most of the people would just make their regular order like he had asked him how can i help you but every once in a while somebody would be like you have hot dogs and he'd be like no <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd be like no well, what kind of bread do you want <laughs> and just like without any you know any kind of uh, thing it was just and that's another example I've been talking about. So when we had like a crew of people like that, then it's just, you know, everybody's having a great time. Of course, the, the fun part was like when we'd have the Guardian people, uh, SJ types in the crew who would always be like scolding us over these little things, like <laughs> as if it was some huge deal. Like, you know, when we ran out of flustered or flannays on the line, <laughs> we were supposed to just like, you know, like put the bottle gently in this other thing to be taken to the back and like, you know, washed out or replaced or whatever. But, um, you know, I would just go ahead and toss the bottle all the way across down the line. So, you know, that it passed like the maximum number of people before hitting the thing <laughs> on the other side. And this one guy worked with just always just give me these looks like, why are you doing that? Because like, it's fun. Right. And it doesn't hurt anything. Not once did I make it explode mustard in his face. Like <laughs> Would have been funny, but I didn't do that. <laughs> you, does that spark any something similar with you, Shannon? As an experience? Oh, yeah. Go on then, give yeah, us the details, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love to mix words. I like to put two words together just to make it sound funny. That's actually something in the Kersey when he talks about the word usage of SP as being pictorial and uh, consonant and uh, what was the other one? Qualitative. Uh, so got that sensory acuity towards aspects of things. And so consonant being words, put, things that sound good. So I, I recently saw a report about uh, U.S. fighter pilots renaming their fighters to something that sounds better. So they call the F-35 Lightning II the Panther, and they'll call the uh, and that made me think. And they call the the Fairchild Thunderbolt II the Warthog. So I just thought, oh, that 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 sounds like an SP thing. Just wanting it to sound good. That kind of thing. Yeah, each day I wake up, I say, I ask myself, how can I be most qualitative today? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's like the finer things where, and I think Kersey gave the example of, say, when comparing instruments, like, oh, you want this golf club, it does this. Like, just the. Uh, I know, I know, he was going a bit INTP on it by saying that, oh, the the, the SPs are very skillful tools, and so they're very uh, aware of the best tools to use and their qualities. And I suppose he was also looking at the fact that. Um, because they are so much in the now, they notice all the finer details of the now. And so, so, so towards the qualities of things, the qualities of sounds and sights, I suppose. But I suppose that can also be true of uh, SJs. So, Jeff, how have you noticed that, like, how you sort of the way sort of artisans and guardians perceive things or details of things uh, is, is it more okay is it more sentimental with sjs i like to go oh i like that thing i used to have one of those when i was eight or uh, those kind of sentimental kind of things associations with it i mean maybe uh i i, I feel some of that too so yeah. Just, that's yeah. Yeah. It's like, and if somebody gets older, it's like you've recently done your eighties marathon, haven't you, Jeff? And uh, that's for the benefit of the audience. I know perfectly well he's been doing his eighties <laughs> <laughs> marathon. He's now I, in the I end. Don't know. 
I don't know exactly if I'd call it a marathon, but uh, a cruise. <laughs> um, no, I've never been on a cruise. I'm sorry. What's something very enjoyable that you, you did over a long time? A nostalgia cruise, however you wish to frame it. Right then. I'll get back to this. Whether on the battlefield with their power sensing <laughs> or the stage <laughs> in, the, in the corporate suit. Uh, is that suit or suite? I don't know. In Are the you... corporate, yep, corporate suite or the political arena, SPs are busy making maneuvers with equipment of all sorts, from paintbrushes to basketballs, jet planes to tanks, even singers, dancers, and actors call their voice or their body their instrument. And comedians describe their skill with an audience as working the room. Artisans can handle their equipment in an expediting, that's for the STPs, or an improvising, the SFPs way, or both. But they are interested first and last always in working with equipment. Is that true for you, Shannon? Yeah. I, I use my body as an yeah. instrument and like... Just for example, yesterday we were unboxing an EEG machine at work and yeah. somebody else was setting it up and I was just seeing how I would do it differently. <laughs> and so we put it on and a, a co-worker and she had a lot of hair and you right. have to have the electrodes on the scalp to get a good connection. And I was thinking about how I would have done it a little differently. The, the other person wanted to plan it and braid the person's hair and make room for it ahead of time before even putting it on and I would have just put it on and then just made room after so yeah. I was just noticing a little bit of difference there right I think that's a good example of SP temperament coming through in minor ways in an atypical action uh, let's put the EEG machine on something more associated <laughs> with NTs but doing it in a um, artisan way yeah um, Interesting. So, have you seen some of the videos we've done with Dario Nardi when he's talked about his EEG research? I did watch a couple of those. Yeah, it's fascinating. I almost want to get his questions and <laughs> yeah, I mean, I he's, got, in. he's got a, a neuro PQ test, which is sort of sort of him cashing in on it, and where sort of like he's asking the similar kind of questions that he would ask the person who's who's hooked up to the EEG. Oh, you're making notes. <laughs> uh, what did you note down there? Is that check out there? I can't remember. I'm going to look up the, the Nardi. Yeah, it's keys yeah. to cognition. Keys to cognition. And I recently found the, uh, the playlist because it wasn't on and I put it in the, um, on, on the channel on the front page. If you scroll all the way down, it will say um, cognitive faculties. And uh, if you click on that, I've then attached that playlist. I've done three videos. I've done one with Hannah, where we went through the test, the keys to condition. I've done it with Jonathan, and I've done it with Haley. And Haley answered the questions in a very INTJ way, where she criticised all the questions and the grammar. <laughs> so... <laughs> and then at the end, she got ISTJ. <laughs> but that was because of the way Dario defines SI. It's sort of like T. Haley answered those kind of questions for T. E. reasons, because of like following a procedure, but she was doing it for like T. E. reasons. So that was so she ended up getting ISTJ. Yeah, but when she did the MBTI with Jeff, uh, she got uh, she only had two sensing answers, and she was 100% I. Well, 100% reserved, 100% uh, thinker, 100% J. So. Uh, uh, working with equipment. It's like my complete opposite. <laughs> yeah, but some of them can be like really into it. Like Shalina's really into, um, and Dario's getting into um, H diverted sense. It just there's this thing that they admire in others that they wish they could do, sort of free themselves up a bit and being so much in their heads and reserved and worried about the consequences of things. This is an interesting observation from 
Persia. And this is re actually repeated in Dario Nardi's book, um, Eight Keys to Self-Leadership. And he sort of expands on this by talking about things like, um, and Jeff has talked about preference versus reality. A good, very good video on his channel. So if you just type in ESFP, preference versus reality, you'll get Jeff's video. Um, the idea, I'll, I'll go, th and so, I'll just, so Dario would have things like, in his book, Eight Keys to Self-Leadership, in the final 50 pages, things like high key and low key use, um, the difference between preference and skill, where because of maybe somebody's environment or they work, they learn to practice something which they don't have a necessary preference for. And so they can, and then, and so I suppose what can happen in certain situations is when somebody develops a skill that they're not, that they don't naturally have a preference for, that somebody who is very good at that particular thing might notice that that particular person is quite technical in doing that thing that they're not naturally predisposed to because it's something that they've trained themselves uh, to be good at. Um, <clears throat> now, skills are acquired by practice. No practice, no skill. Much practice, much skill. And skill will wither on the vine and gradually fade away in the, in the degree it is starved of practice. And the same skill will increase precisely in the degree it is given exercise in practice the, new, the neural cell is no different from the muscle cell in this use it or lose it is nature's inviolable law do you think that's true Shannon? and no duh <laughs> oh, duh um yeah i think that i'm robotic almost in the things that i do that aren't so much preferred yeah. I do them anyways because I, I'm an SPSO so I'm in tune to, to what a society wants and I'm doing those things very robotically some people yeah. point it out to me like I'll even do things like a, in a robotic type of voice that sounds unnatural when I'm talking about topics and maybe I don't then maybe aren't my favorite right um Are there any things which you practice, Jeff? Well, what I was going to say was um, yeah. uh, that is something that I th that, that area is something I think that a lot of people misunderstand in the sense that um, I, get, I guess misunderstood, uh, you know, what Kersey has said. Like they, there's people online who try to accuse him of like, creating or fostering stereotypes and like, Oh, if you're, you know, a certain type, you are tied to a certain occupation or something. And that's not what he ever actually said. Um, and he expands on that in the book brains and careers that it's more about, there are certain, uh, occupations and callings in life, whatever you want to call it, that naturally tend to draw people based on their type like that there's things are sort of naturally predisposed to, but it doesn't mean they can't do other jobs. It just means that basically the closer that a particular task is to something that comes naturally for that person, the easier it's going to be, which is kind of common sense. Uh, and because they're interested in it, like this part says, they're going to practice it more and get better at it. <laughs> so the people that are willing, you know, uh, you know, there's another part of the, uh, chapter where he talks about um repetition compulsion huh. and you know and those things that he talked about like you know just to use sports as an example uh the people that are really good at sports it's like yeah they have some natural talent and ability they start out with which causes them to you know kind of want to show that off or you know or just keep doing it and then the more that they do that the better they get at it and the more the more they do that you know the more they just keep repeating it and they're the ones willing to spend hours and hours practicing because that they actually enjoy the activity itself. So they don't mind practicing it because it's that that's just doing the activity over and over again. Yeah. Whereas there are people that would not spend the time doing that because either they get bored with it or they would 
figure out very quickly that they didn't have enough talent to do it or they just didn't, you know, just whatever reason was interesting enough to them. So because of that, they would only occasionally play. And so they would never really get much better. Um, so it's a difference between somebody that's, you know, an athlete versus somebody that, you know, might shoot some hoops every now and then, you know, <laughs> and it's like, and both can be SP types. I'm not saying that they can't, you know, but it's just whatever, if the artisan type is interested in something, if they really get into it, then they're more likely to get better at it because they just do it so much. So that's the thing is that it's not that, you know, there can't be an INFJ basketball player, for instance, or there can't be an ISTP that's a counselor or, you know, whatever. Like those things can obviously be done. Yeah. But that person is going to have to work harder to get better at that thing because it doesn't come as naturally to them. So it's going to require like more than just their natural way of being to get to that point, to get proficient yeah. at something. I'll just uh, say for the audience that's unfamiliar with Enneagram, when um, Shannon said SPSO, she meant self pres social in a instinctual stack in. Um, and of course, this next paragraph basically is, you know, saying what I said about, you know, there's a feedback relation between interest and ability. We improve in doing things we're interested in doing and have greater interest in things we do well. Interest reinforces skill, skill reinforces interest, and neither seems to be the starting point. So the artisan's lifelong interest in tactical action fuels their daily exercise of tactical skills, and as tactical skill increases, so then does interest in it, precisely and exclusively measured by the amount of practice. So, and then even says, we all have our short suit as well as our long suit and the things we do well. Whatever our long suit, we are to not totally without talent in our short suit, it is merely shorter. So that's, again, yeah. you know, a, I was sort of paraphrasing what's, already there in terms of um you know it's not saying that just everybody is locked into this one uh thing that they're they do all their life yeah and sps especially are notorious for getting tired of a particular activity and just changing it which always seems to flabbergast the other types like even when it was when it's somebody who is like in the public eye you know like a professional at something like you know when paul newman uh, quits acting to become a race car driver and things like that. Mm. You know, saying Joe Gibbs did the same thing. He was a football coach and he quit and became a race car guy. You know, wow. um, and the same thing with you know with singers that become actors, actors become singers. Um, Michael Jordan quits basketball to play baseball. You know, it's like some of them are not as drastic changes as others, but they're still changes where people don't really understand because they're like, oh, this person is really good at this. They're making a lot of money. They're well known. Why would they suddenly decide to risk? that and do something that they're maybe not as good at and people don't know them for doing. And it's all part of that same thing of wanting to take risks and try new things and getting bored with doing the same thing over and over again, because the things that are important to other people aren't necessarily important to them. I remember Brett Favre, the you know quarterback in the NFL, uh, he retired, but then he got bored with whatever he else was doing and wanted to come back. Uh, and all these people in the media were saying things about how this was going to tarnish his legacy. And he didn't care about his legacy. He just wanted to play football <laughs> because he was bored. So he went, and, and it was a challenge himself. And the really thing, the most amazing was, it's like when he first came back, he went to a different team. He went to the Jets because the Packers didn't have room for anymore. And that was one thing. It's like the Packers fans sort of be like, okay, we can accept he's in, a, he's in the other conference. He's not playing us, whatever. But then... He went to the Minnesota Vikings, who were like one of the main rivals of the Packers. And he sort of relished in the whole, like, now the Packers fans are turning against him thing. Because it was like, oh, now it's fun to come in as the enemy. Because I've always been, like, the guy who could do no wrong for these people. So, And again, a lot of people didn't understand that. They were like, why would he turn his back on Green Bay and do this? You know, <laughs> it's like, like, it wasn't about that. <laughs> it was about having fun and enjoying this new way of... You know, after having such a long career, suddenly he's got this way of sort of reinventing himself while still doing the same thing that he'd always been doing. So, again, it's like sometimes it's drastic changes in what you're doing, but sometimes it's the same activity, but doing it in a way that sort of reinvigorates your interest. In. Yeah, um, I've written down some points. First, first thing I put SP points for the guitar behind you, Shannon. It's a very nice uh, guitar. Is that yours? 
No, actually. <laughs> <laughs> actually, well, I did teach myself guitar, <laughs> but that one's not mine. All right. Um, one of the things, so, so I wondered about this thing. So SPs like to improvise, but there's all this thing about practice. So do you think they would vary? Because I, I would imagine that SJs, they would love to practice, and it would be exactly the same thing every time as they practice. What sort of things have you heard, Jeff, about, I mean, do, do the artisans want to vary it a bit in the practice or want more oh, match sure. practice? I mean, yeah, if you're just doing the exact same things every time, then that can get boring. But, um, but yeah, like I said earlier, you know, the it, it, practice itself isn't going to be boring because you're repeating something you enjoy doing. So it's boring if you don't enjoy the thing you're doing. But if you are, if you do enjoy it, then it's just repetition of the same thing. But, um, but yeah, changing things up, obviously, doing things slightly a different way is always going to make it more fun than just constantly doing things exactly the same way over and over again. Um, and so, you know, it's, I've, I've talked before about seeing the different personalities of people in different areas, like, um, you know, basketball coaches that, uh, three NBA coaches come to mind. There were longtime coaches that were different temperaments and all were successful and won NBA championships, but did it very different ways. And, Greg Popovich, the San Antonio Spurs coach, I think is a guardian type. And he's, you know, stayed with the same team all these years and his method and his, and his like way of doing things stays very much the same. He's very, he's the ex military guy who like kind of has this mentality of the number one thing is getting good character guys that will buy into his system and basically do things his way over and over and over again. And he's yeah. been very successful doing that. Uh, Meanwhile, um, Phil Jackson, who I think is a NT rational type, uh, is somebody who very carefully selected teams that were already uh, championship caliber and sort of came in and installed his way of doing things to sort of put them over the top. So he was never somebody who, you know, went into a situation of a last place team and tried to turn them around because that's not what he wants to do. That would be too inefficient for him. <laughs> he wants to come into a situation where the pieces are already in place and he just, it's like, more like a chess game where he's just moving the pieces where they need to be in order to complete the, the strategy to win. Um, and then a third example and sort of almost the opposite of that or the opposite of both of the first two is Larry Brown, who I think is an SP artisan type and rather, and he kept switching teams, but he kept going to bad teams and then making <laughs> them good. And then once they were good, then he would leave and go somewhere else yeah. because he was bored with it then. And so he, you know, his whole thing was, I can impress people and not just that, but you know, impress them, but just have fun doing this where I go into a situation where everybody's saying, Oh, this team's lousy and hopeless. And I do, I work my magic to make them good. And then once they're good, I'm like, okay, I prove I can do that. Now I go do it somewhere else. And he did yeah. both in college and in the NBA. So he, he's, and back and forth and back and forth. So he's, and, and about, about every time that people were like, Oh, he's reached like the pinnacle of, you know, what he can do with this situation and a lot of people expecting that to be something he would like coast on and continue to make money in it. No, then he would quit and go somewhere else. No. <laughs> so, you know, so, it's an example of three people from with very different perspectives on how to accomplish the same things. And I suppose with the SP coach, it's not just making the team be good. It's like so that people can see the transition, can see the impact. Because that's the thing, isn't it, for SP is yeah. making an impact. Yeah, it's un unquestionably, and, and you know, and all the way, all along, his methods would be questioned. He'd have people, you know, that would be like, uh, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's coming in here and telling us to do things this way, and um, it's not going to work. And, you know, he'd run off some people and things like that, but that was all part of the process. But then each time he did this, of course, he would get more and more credibility where each place he would go into, then people would see that track record and be like, you know, well, wait a minute, this guy might might know what he's talking about since he continues to go to different bad teams and make them good and win championships. Like, you know, maybe we should listen to him, even if it isn't exactly what we want to do. I think what you said there about Phil Jackson, it makes him sound like an NTJ thinking. Yeah, about... that's, that's what I think. Yeah. I, th I think. And, and the funny thing is, you know, I think I mentioned before when I said that to, uh, to, uh, 
Dave Kersey, uh, the junior, um, <laughs> he sort of acted like uh, he thought he was an idealist because, you know, the whole Zen thing, like he was known for like, you know, having this thing about Zen Buddhism and like sending his players on like retreats and stuff to like, you know, connect with each other and stuff like that. But I was like, yeah, he did, did all that. But if you link about the way he, he did it, he like used it as a tool. Ah. <laughs> as opposed to it being this belief system that he was like, oh, he bought into, like, oh, he's so deeply into, oh, he's just really into this Buddhism thing, and it's all, you know, he's he's floating around in his feelings and stuff. It was like, oh, this is a thing that if you get the people together and they and they do this thing, where they like put these distractions out of their mind and focus on something, it's a way to get them to focus on what I want them to focus on in order to be better at basketball, and that's what he used it for. So yeah. to me, that seems a very NT thing to do <laughs> is finding a thing that you can sort of not exploit necessarily sort of. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know of a better word for it. Basically use the thing in a way that impacts people to to make the changes that you want to see happen. Yeah. And uh, functionally, people could say as well that the NTJs, because they're in touch with the NI, they sort of see the benefit of meditating clearing the mind and then yeah. solutions and awarenesses coming into into a clear mind right because uh, there's sort of this stereotype of you know intuitives in general like oh it's you know they're they're in their own head and they're not paying attention to what's going on they're scattered things like that but the thing is is ntjs especially and i'm sure no, they're not the only ones but they're the ones i'm thinking of now can it can be like almost as hyper focused as sps are when it comes to the things that they are trying to accomplish, it can be, you know, precision and all that is very important to them and the focus and being like completely, you know, focused on what it is they're trying to accomplish to the point of, you know, anything else being cast off if it's not part of the overall strategy for what they're trying to accomplish. Right. And that's one of these things was in sports with SP is it's there's also this sort of other aspect of it where it's the status of it sort of like the way guys look up to tom brady or the way tom brady looked up to joe montana and there's the competitive aspect in the challenge and i've heard from some guys say in cricket is like they want a big audience there and they feel that they cannot get up for the game if there's hardly anybody watching yeah and then you've got these and, big game players done and tom brady is like you know every time he talks about like oh well you know i might retire or whatever it's like there, I think he won't until he's, again, he's tired of it himself because every time that he gets written off or like, oh, well, now he's going to be too old to do it or whatever, then he just comes back and here he is back in the Super Bowl again. It's like, you know, and obviously it takes more than just him, but it's like, you know, I think he relishes the fact that every year more people, even though it's like he gains the credibility of continuing to do it every year, there's still those skeptics that are like, okay, well, surely this will be the year where he, he loses a step where he can't do it anymore or he's going to get injured or something. You know, it's just there's always that talk every time. <laughs> and then it's like he can show him one more time. You know? Yeah, it's usually it's whether we quarterbacks, um, it's whether, whether that zip is on the ball. And I think uh, in his final year, uh, Manning, he just lost that zip on the ball. Uh, so kind yeah, of it can it. happen quickly where you can yeah. have somebody that, you know, looks uh, spectacular and then just all of a sudden it's like they just lost it. And mm. the thing I've seen that the most in sports is actually baseball pitchers because there's been so many where, you know, it's it might be just a little bit of a tweak in the arm somewhere or whatever where it's like it seems like their mechanics just break down and all of a sudden the guy that was seemingly unhittable – now he's just getting home runs, you know, teed off on him all the time, you know. So yeah. all of a sudden that pitcher is no longer your star pitcher. He's the guy that you're just praying doesn't give up a home run every time you send him out there. So a, a career can end very quickly. Right. So we've got this and then the, the graphs on the next page. Uh, in the following graph, which shows the natural variation in the development of artisan we have a oh that was weird that was a lot of artisan improvisation there from shannon what was the meaning of this <laughs> 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 
<laughs> if you must know, I, I block the camera when somebody walks past. Oh, right. So okay. Not gotcha. Broadcast. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Um, in the following graph, which shows the natural variation in the development of artisan intelligence, notice that the tactical intelligence of SP is, is usually far advanced over their dip diplomatic intelligence. This disparity occurs because the artisan's constant practice of tactical operations and inconstant practice of diplomatic operations, since the SPs are frequently interested in tactics, rarely interested in diplomacy, note also that their strategic and logistical intelligence lag behind tactics but outdo diplomacy, owing to the middling amount of practice usually give them. Okay, I can give an example of this, and ESTP is, I think, a good example in that they can make tactical moves where they might change an allegiance to one country in order to get a better deal but then other countries might go what the hell we've got treaties with you we're long-term allies this is no way to treat a long-term ally so it's they don't it's like getting so you see the same with trump like he'll do these small things that win on a tactical level but it, it's not it doesn't help these long-term relationships there's more the realm of diplomacy does that make sense jeff probably okay <laughs> probably makes sense <laughs> it probably makes sense to smarter people than me is what i'm saying that's why i said probably shannon does it make sense to you <laughs> It does make sense. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, there's a bit of noise. I'm going to put okay. myself on mute for right now. That's okay. Because it's like, um, in its ultimate form, it would be, in its most extreme form, it would be with ESTP, where everything, it seems, is negotiable. Everything, nothing is off the table. There's not that principled framework to stick to. And so allies of a person like that would think well we don't know where he stands what are his principles what are her principles what do we do everything's there doesn't seem to be a core there everything depends on the situation and they'll use the word because usually the phrase political expediency is used for a politician that just keeps changing their position and flip-flops mm -hmm. and They'll say, you're a flip-flopper. And they'll say, well, the situation has changed. I adapt yeah, to it. Pl plus, they know over time that uh, the electorate doesn't seem to care. Like, even the Guardians will basically swallow it. You know, it's like, well, this is what we need to do now, regardless of whether that was that person's position in the past. Uh, just because so many of them are like that, it's like they've, given up on there being somebody who's consistent <laughs> you know and and occasionally there are people that are that are more consistent but they don't tend to be the and, and they can succeed to a point but they don't tend to be the ones that like get elected president for instance yeah. like for instance you know on on opposite ex extremes you have like bernie sanders and ron paul yeah you know, one fully devoted to the government needs to be all up and everything and one fully committed to get the government out of everything. And they're both really consistent, both been repeatedly elected to Congress for many years, but not elected president because they lost to the people that flip-flopped all over the place mm. based on what people think they want now, what sounds good now. Kucinich and Ron Paul were actually... Um, uh, quite close friends because there, there's quite a few things that they agreed on just yeah, from different and, perspectives and there's a lot of that you know in terms of uh um politicians that you know they're they're opposed to each other in terms of their ideas but they can still find a lot in common personally too yeah, yeah also in terms of the ideas of like civil liberties and both of them being against the patriot act there were things that right. they both agreed on yeah, there's a lot of little alliances like that, you know. Yeah. And some of them are just regional. You know, I learned that as I started paying attention to politics in the '90s. That, you know, it would be something like when one of those bills came up about um, like tobacco subsidies, and strangely enough, you'd have all the congressmen from the ah. states where tobacco farms were that were 
in favor of the tobacco subsidies, whereas the, the other people in the other states were not. Like, you know, and things like that repeatedly, you know, congressman's got a military base in their district, and they're going to vote for the funding for the military base, whereas somebody who's got a district that's, you know, entirely the beach or whatever <laughs> is voting against it. You know, wonder why. I, I think one of the things where Bernie Sanders was, it's like it once happened in the um, Democratic primary, uh, for 2016, where uh, they were criticizing Bernie Sanders for being in favor of gun rights, and he basically says, I'm from New Hampshire, where it's normal. Vermont, actually. Oh, so yes, Vermont, I am so sorry, damn it. <laughs> but yeah, he said he was from a rural state, so yeah. you know, he was kind of implying it's like you're not going to you're not going to win election in a rural state if you say you, you're anti-guns. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, he just admitted... So I wonder what says that says about Bernie Sanders, about his uh, type. Well, a... it says that, again, he's still a politician. Like it's, yes, exactly. <laughs> consistent in a lot of things, but one of those things is, is that he knows his own state where he's at, and he's not going to uh, you know, go for something that's going to alienate enough people that he can't win re-election again. So. Um, one of the things Ronald Reagan did, uh, ESFP, performer artisan, is that when he, when he primaried Ford in 1976, part of his campaign in the primary was to reform social, in, social security. Because he was like looking forward and seeing the problems with it, but that was not what the public wanted to hear. And with a lot of the Republican voters being guardians, they didn't want their security uh, taken away. So, yeah, that's, that's the thing is, um, you know, the, the sort of, uh, not irony exactly, but this is just the sort of situation you create when you have, you know, people that are like conservative from a political standpoint, but they're conservative in terms of they don't want to change things too much. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it's in the direction that is considered quote unquote conservative, they still don't want to go too far if they're personally like conservative. I <laughs> mean, so it's different, different meanings of the same word. So the, the Guardian conservatives are kind of like, hey, wait a minute, you know, this has been in place for 50 years. Maybe we should be careful about this. And I've paid in. you have artisan conservatives that were like, no, let's throw it away and scrap the system and do something new because this is, you know, not what is true to our principles or whatever. So, you know, that's why you have those different approaches to the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so these are things, these are like the predisposed roles. So you can say with the provider, that's like the the alpha SFs in socionics, where it frequently talks about comfort sensing, things like that. And so you've got ISFJ that, that uh, is naturally predisposed to being sensitive towards somebody who's, who, who's ill and their health needs. And even in, in Victor's profile of the SFJ, it, it says things about being a host and all of these things. And I was looking at that, I was thinking, this is so provider guardian in terms of like the genius name for it like so like provider supplier for esfj and provider uh, protector for isfj this is from personology change some of the terminology and then you've got mediating for the nfps so a little bit more about rapport and then mentoring a little bit more uneven where you've got director and directee so again you've got this thing of an informing role and a directive role and so for SJs, you can see that monitoring is a, a directive role. Get, get to work, you artisans. <laughs> this is shoddy work. So it's a so directive. And then you've got the providing, like the jolly organizers of the SFJs. And then you've got the constructors, constructors of theories and models, the, the NTPs, and then the coordinators. There's a strategic well, vision the mastermind. Let me tell you something. ESFJs aren't always jolly. Yes, I've. Uh, that's in Victor's profile as well. They they will they will say how they feel about things. In in fact, we even uh, recently talked about uh, Dr. McCoy from Star Trek being yes. a good fictional example of a of a male ESFJ, and he's definitely not jolly most of the time. <laughs> Spends more of his time like complaining about things and yeah, talking about how lousy everything is. And I suppose he's a good example of the conflict relation in socionics where you've got Spock, INTJ, and McCoy, ESFJ, 
and they clash over the fact that look you're not expressive what is it why don't you have some feelings and then I anti and then he's like look you're ruled by emotions and you and all these kind of things and that's a classic example of how ESFJ and INTJ sort of react with each other with those two so that captured it well and then you've got Kirk as ESTP uh, one of those examples I suppose of a well-developed eight uh, and actually in Star Trek the motion picture it has these things where you've got this alien object that's coming towards earth and it's like we've got to get there. the ship's not ready we've got to get we've got to get and then he's pushing them so hard that things are going wrong on the ship arguably you could say somebody died in a transporter accident because he was pushing things on being too expedient trying to expedite things so expedite a promoter and uh mccoy came up to him in star trek the motion picture and said jim you're pushing your people know their jobs and they had this big thing about and he and so he would go into the psychology of Kurt. No, you did it because you want to be on the Enterprise again. You're in love with the Enterprise. So there's little things like that. I know some people call Star Trek the motion picture, Star Trek the slow motion picture, because it's about <laughs> ideas. It's a great one for the NTs. Uh, so I like, yeah, I like that first film. It's kind of like a lot of setup and then kind of the letdown is the way I looked at it. Yeah, it's a little bit of an anticlimax. Yeah, they, about... they make, you know, it, it's so much a lot. Yeah, well, basically they discover that this, you know, well, I won't, you know, spoiler for those people who haven't seen the, the movie from 1979 or whatever it was, but <laughs> but they they reach the ultimate destination of what, why this, you know, thing is, is destroying things or whatever, and it's this response to the Voyager uh, satellite we sent out, like, with, you know, it, it's like sending out information and this computer basically has learned all of that information and wants more information. <laughs> and so it's like demanding information and blowing things up to get people's attention, I guess. So it's kind of like, oh, okay. And then, you know, weird things, some sort of melding with humans and computers, and then everything's happening. Well, that, right? hey, I tell you, that's an NT fantasy for some INTJs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Reverend Camden from Seventh Heaven melds with the computer, and then everything's fine. <laughs> it's like, really, what? That's yeah. your solution. I, I actually asked I, David. I think even a lot fun. of NTs would, would find that a little bit ludicrous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, um, the Delton. So this is some I asked uh, about this in the the Kersey because he recently changed it from Kersey temperament theory to Kersey temperament model to sort of emphasize it's a model and to make it like hold it at further distance. Um, and so I asked him about this and he said that it can vary between those two in the middle. And so he asked about something like uh, where. Um, those types, so somebody like, so it's not necessarily like this, because, you know, external factors, people can, so people, I think, my personal opinion is that NTJs are going to be better at logistics than NTPs, because they're TE types, it's edge diverted thinker. So it, it's not as big of a difference between ENTJ and ESTJ, is it is between INTP and ESTJ. Yeah, so I, mean, I think that makes sense to a point. Yeah. And just so, like I've said, you know, as SFPs, uh, we don't have as big as of a difference from NFs as the STPs do. Yeah. Um, so even though we still part ways on that whole intuition thing, but we're closer in terms of that dis diplomacy aspect, we're, pro we're better at it than the STPs are in general, like I said, not if somebody, an STP is that, you know, that's what they go into this, as their field of study or whatever that they're spending all their time doing, then they'll, they'll be able to get better. But in terms of just sort of natural instinct, the yeah. STPs are slightly more you see that developed in that area. You see that with Richard Bandler, uh, ESTP, and not in the Council of Road of role of helping people. And he still does it in a very directive way. I think Morgan might love Richard Bandler. 
it's very like um assertive and like with his uh clients and uh and he had this big uh rant against this whole idea of being um authentic or being phony or fake and he was saying well what is fake and it's like well, is that what you want to be and then what you change and it depends on the situation and he got quite annoyed by that idea of and he was saying things like were you were you fake sort of last year when you were a different person and you changed now because it was about this idea of changing into something well is that fake because you're going to be into the thing that you're going to change into just it's a very sort of estp ish mindset that's sort of the opposite of infp which is really about having a consistent identity uh, and an authenticity um what do you think about that, Shannon? As somebody who's like sort of with ISFP, there's sort of a bridge between being authentic and sort of principled with the FI thing, but being artisan and flexible and adaptive. So I I'm kind of thinking about how like you being a six going yeah. back to the Enneagram. So I would disintegrate to three, the achiever. Right. And I'm, my mind is blown right now thinking about how if the SPs want an audience, maybe yeah. I'm not dis disintegrating to three, the achiever, but I'm actually just wanting to engage an audience. Well, you so can go. Not... As you know, they modified the theory so you can go to the high and low side yeah. of the connected types. So I, if I want to make an impact, I'm looking at it, is that an SP thing or is that, am I going to three? Well, it's different models are sort of capturing the same <laughs> thing, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that, that's, that, that's the sort of thing. But I think Jeff told the story of like the ISDP wants to turn up, make an impact, and then sort of leave everyone going, who was that guy? <sighs> Because it's like almost as if they don't want to stay around for the, one of the what is it, the mysterious stranger that turns up, makes an impact. I suppose it's like in a Western with Clint Eastwood, where the guy who turns up, saves the day, and then leaves. <laughs> uh, we've got. Uh... But yeah, the, one of the reasons it's like this. So the theory being that, say with SP's hair, that. And this is one of the things I asked Junior, that in Kersey terms, diplomacy is the opposite of tactics because tactics is concrete and abstract, or rather the, the artisans are concrete and abstract, and the, and the idealists are abstract and um, and uh, cooperative. Sorry. Concrete and utilitarian, the SPs and uh, the NFs are abstract and cooperative. So that sort of gets in, it, it, it depends on the field. But like I said, it's those things with Trump being without principles and well, everything's up for negotiation, and the NFs will stick to their principles. So if you have your guidelines and your principles, when you reach a situation, and you might be well, you can't act because of this, these principles that you have. An SP is going to be thinking, and Bandler would say, you've got limiting beliefs. You are holding beliefs that are limiting your options. And the NS would say, no, that is who I am. I want my actions to be consistent with who I am. So there's that different mindset. However, the SFPs, they do have that sort of instinct for the, the right thing. Um, and they would say, and I think Jeff has said that um, it always depend on, depends on each particular moment. But I suppose if you were to see, see a sort of sample size of them in those moments, you would spot a trend uh, with them. Where, so uh, Kersey wrote something about, I think he, wrote, he said that ISFP was one of the kindest of the types. And then he said that, and he gave an example of, oh, they might be a, a doting parent, really. But then once their children 
you've grown up, get a divorce and then go paint in the mountains. So sort of that tension there between the artisan temperaments, but them also being accommodating. So, uh, and Jeff, yeah, we talked about that off air about a week ago, Shannon, with Jeff there, when we asked about ISFB being accommodator, but just not as accommodating as ISFJ. They're super accommodator. Um, huh. Or maybe they're not, Jeff. What do you think? <laughs> well, I just immediately thought of an ISFJ that I wouldn't really describe as accommodating. <laughs> well, enlighten kind of me. depends on the person. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, in general, probably there is. Yeah, most ISFJs probably would, you know, instinctually lean in that direction no. of being accommodating. But but it's accommodating in their way, in terms of the way they think is right. Right. So, which can clash with people who don't think the same way. Right. Gotcha. Same. So that's the that's the thing that I think is the often the conflict between artisans and guardians is that because they are the cooperators, guardians have this mentality of like th these things are the supposed to do it this way type of things. Yeah. And so they can come across to many artisans as well they don't really care about you know accommodating me in any way because they're just they're trying to get me to conform to something rather than doing something for my benefit. Right. Can I hear an INFJ in the background, Jeff? What's that? Can I hear an INFJ in the background? I don't understand your question. Oh, I thought your mother was there. No. Because <laughs> it sort of sounded a bit like her. Uh, Who did? It was just, it just sounds in the background. And uh, it just... Uh, Made a crazy one of those crazy intuitive connections that's based on no, nothing. Uh, there's, it's just me and Morgan. <laughs> it's me and my. My mother is 180 miles away. Right, because because she was in the background recently when you visited her. Um, uh, there's a reason why the uh, SP profile is the mirror image of the NF profile. SPs are concrete like SJs, and so are likely to practice some of those concrete logistical operations that SJs tend to be so good at. Also, SP is a utilitarian like NTs, and so are likely to practice some of those util utilitarian operations involved in strategic planning. Thus, depending on circumstances, depending on circumstances, logistical and strategic intelligence are likely to develop almost equally given the SP's two second suits. But, but having nothing in common with NFs, SP is, well, from the point of view of their um, from this point of view, but some functions, what if they become developed? Uh, but having nothing in common with NS, SPs tend to neglect diplomatic operations, which usually come in a distant fourth in the race for intellectual development. What do you think, Jeff, of SFPs when it comes to diplomacy? I love SFPs. Yeah, but you know what I mean? Does it sort of go beyond? Like, when you've looked at that bit of Kersey theory, have you probably, when it talks about diplomacy, have you thought, wait a minute, SFPs can be pretty good at this, but in a different way? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I said that, like, ten minutes ago. Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> you can't remember? You just said you remember all of my good stories. <laughs> well, the funny anecdotes, but... Um... Oh, well, I guess I didn't make it funny enough for you. <laughs> Uh, I'm bad at multitasking. Um, but I would think that from a functions point of view, SFPs with that introverted feeling, they might, you know, understanding people, maybe being a little bit more diplomatic. So it's like, I just wondered if there was something yeah. there. Yeah, go on. The way I framed it is that um, SFPs generally don't like go out of their way to, to try to cause problems for people no that doesn't mean they don't cause problems for people but they usually come from their expression like bothering other people but like in general like if i okay an example i've given is you know i have a coworker that like uh when he's driving 
uh, with me in the car, like he's aware that I get like motion sickness and he'll still like do things with the car to like try to get me sick. Oh, you know, because to him, it's a big joke because and my attitude is I wouldn't do that to him. If there was something that I knew bothered him in the same way, I wouldn't do it. So I'm more courteous than he is. And if you want to call that diplomatic, I don't know. But I consider more about like, I don't say, oh, this person has something that bothers them. I'm going to try to do that on purpose because that's so funny. Ha ha. ha. You know, it's a snack guy that's DSTP. He pretends I do the same thing. You know, I don't. <laughs> I pretend no such thing. I go based on what is shown to me by whoever. So, but that's a a fairly common thing that I've seen is that it's not extreme either way in terms of it's not that there's, you know, ESTPs never care about people's feelings because obviously they do regardless of what Morgan says that I think I I think about him. <laughs> I don't really think that. <laughs> Uh, and obviously not every SFP is like super in tune with people's feelings or always just considering them while they're doing it because they can be, you know, just as selfish or, or uh, single minded as anybody in terms of, um, you know, not considering those things if it's just not rising to that level in their mind at the time. But in general, I think the what we want to do, you know, would be perceived by people as being a little bit more diplomatic, but not always like we're still. I think all SPs tend to be called blunt and things like that, and people say that they're not, you know, they don't have good etiquette or whatever in various situations because part of that is chosen <laughs> because SPs don't like to do things just because it's quote-unquote what you're supposed to do. But some of it is just that, um, you know, we're just not naturally inclined to think of things that way. But it doesn't mean, like, I'm always thinking about, you know, I don't want to hurt people's feelings, but... Uh, in another one of my anecdotes, yeah. I, I told the story of um, a time where I was a kid and I was at the mall with a friend of mine. We went to a movie <clears throat> and this friend had younger twin sisters who were with us. And uh, at some point, um, you know, it was <clears throat> probably winter. So we had like heavy coats, but we were inside. So we took them off because it was you know, heater inside. Uh, so I had my heavy coat and I like hit him with it and not even like because I was angry with him just because it was like something to do. I was bored or whatever. And his sisters started like giggling about it. They thought it was really funny when I hit him with the jacket. So I did it again. And then and he asked me to stop. And, you know, I waited and then I like I did it again anyway, because it was like in that moment entertaining my audience of his sisters was like more of a thrill for me you know it was it was like the thing that seemed more in the moment to do than to consider that i was hurting his feelings or even physically hurting him by doing that so i felt bad afterward because i was like well it wasn't you know he said something like you know i thought you were my friend or something like that you know it's, it got really <laughs> dramatic about it uh and so i felt bad that he was hurt by it but it was like in that moment, that was not a compelling uh, feeling in me, I guess. You know, yeah. I, obviously, I'd like to think I've matured since then, yeah. <laughs> but I can't say for sure that there aren't moments that are similar, even as an adult, because there's times where you're just caught up in that moment of uh, performance or entertaining people that you may not necessarily um, consider uh, how what you're doing might be affecting somebody. I think. Jeff talked about this when we did our first recorded video in 2013 where you were talking about how the SJs with the guilt guts and then you gave this as an example of the of the, of the one of the few times where you got close to that and it was that story just then. Yeah, I don't I've never felt what they were describing because I don't yeah. have like you know, I don't have guilt gut <laughs> I don't <laughs> have like a feeling like oh I'm I'm being debilitated by this feeling of, oh, I did this horrible thing in the past or whatever. Uh, that I've never felt that way. Uh, so the feeling bad about that situation was just feeling, oh, I'm sorry that I hurt him and I don't want us to not be friends anymore because of what I did. But it wasn't something that like kept me up at night or anything like that. You know, it wasn't something where I'm like overwhelmed with, oh, I did this thing and I feel guilt about it. That I've never really experienced. So this good thing is thing in Kersey, the um, 
and, and, and with the barons as well she developed it like the interaction styles where you've got the sdp is directive and you've got the sfp is informant and so um and linda barons calls uh uh, when it's informing and reserved, she calls that behind the scenes. When it's informing and expressive, she calls that, um, uh, oh, she calls that get things going. David calls it, calls it collaborative. And David Kersey called behind the scenes accommodator. And so, and SDPs would be in, char yeah, in charge in Bowens, an initiator in Kersey. And ISDP would be, uh, contending in Kersey and uh, chart the course in Barons. And so and I asked uh, David Mark about this and he said that, and he agreed that when you're actually talking about the type, if you're using personology terminology, you would actually say for ISFP, tactical accommodator, and that the role that they are predisposed to is that of the composer. There's a slight difference between type and role because what happens is you get that blend between nature and nurture and the social field. And so you've got that sort of sociological aspect of Kersey temperament theory of types being predisposed towards certain social roles. And we looked at those before with the SJs with, with monitoring and um, providing. Uh, on a logistical level and with the NFs towards mentoring and mediating and the NT is to be, between coordinating which would be and uh, constructing so these and you also talked about like this sort of secondary role being or like being the second most common role so for instance for my type the you know performer being the primary role but composer being like the something we also could do a lot of yeah and, and an example that's easy to follow because it's, you know, th those words are used often with music, um, is that obviously there are plenty of performers that compose their own music. Now, not all of them do, and not all composers perform their music, <laughs> yeah. but some do both. So obviously that's a very natural, like, you know, roles that are in tandem with each other. And, and why that I have for a long time thought I was an ISFP because again the composer role comes very naturally to me also. So that aspect made it easy for me to fit myself into that idea um, before I really learned what introversion extroversion really was. So on the related thing of so you've got ISFP that's pre predisposed to um an accommodator and they're concrete and adapt adaptive and with intp you've got someone who's abstract and adaptive and they're also an accommodator and if you think about what intp is good at in terms of designing things well that's on a strategic level but then there's not that much difference between designing and composing it's just that with the composing is a little bit more near it's not as long-term and strategic with them but you could also say that if an isfp is writing a novel they have to bring that strategic intelligence in of just plotting everything forward and thinking about long-term implications and setting things up so you can see how not in terms of functions but in terms of what they're good at how the sort of types can relate to each other so uh in kersey what ESTJ is good at would be furthest away from INTP because it's boring logistical stuff and it's ordering people around. And so whereas, whereas what SF, ESFP is good at, uh, which is entertaining people or, uh, and not in a directive way, but in a fun way, well, that's closer to um, uh, INTP because INTP is adaptive, ESFP is also adaptive, INTP is informing, uh, ESFP is also informing, whereas ESTJ, they're directive and they're concrete. Yes, there's some functional things in common, but in terms of what they're good at, they're very far apart. Does 
Does that make sense, Jeff, or does it just... Probably. Okay. High praise. Does it yeah, make sense? I, think, <laughs> I, I think it probably, probably does. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, yeah, that, that's why I thought that Howie Mandel interview was so good. Because, um, uh, uh, I don't remember. I only saw it once, but um, about what you were just talking about with... Uh, yeah, in terms of entertaining and um, hmm. anyway, he was talking a lot about those those kind of things I have about finding like ways to um, entertain people and 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 I don't remember. Sorry, I I thought when I started talking about that that I was going to remember enough to to refer to it, but I'm going blank now. So that's okay, uh, Jeff. You can't be brilliant all the time. <laughs> yeah. You've already been on good form. <laughs> so, uh, while all the artisans have a tactical... Yeah, after, after you've form. actually seen that, we can talk about it more. Yeah, okay, I, will, I think I forwarded it, to, forwarded it to another account so that when I look in the other account, I see it as... I should have actually forwarded it to myself that when I look at it, and then it's the Harry Mandel clip. So, I, don't, I do not mind being reminded. It's like, Ben, watch this thing. Okay. Um... While all the artisans have tactical intelligence in common, they differ in the kinds of tactical roles they like to practice. In broad terms, artisans are interested in playing the role of what I call the operator or the entertainer. He changed operator to expediter in uh, personal G and entertainer, he changed it to improviser. So if you think of Trump, Trump is very expeditious. He's always getting stuff done, not really thinking about the consequences, Spots an opportunity, get it done. Uh, and then there's a bit of a mess afterwards that other people can clear up. Um, I call the option. So that, that actual mindset, though, is very good in a crisis which needs quick thinker. So if you think on the battlefield or in sports, when something changes and adapting quickly. Uh, and, of course, if the person has a lot of experience, then they, they tend to react in the right way because they're so immersed in the present context and the situation they're attuned to all the little nuances, and so it sort of guides how they react. Because they've got all the, all the details in there. Um, and these give rise to four tactical role variants. The promoter, ESCP, the crafter, ISCP, the performer, ESFP, and the composer, ISFP. All artisans in their own right, but differing significantly in their artistry. The following chart presents the SP tactical roles and role variants alongside their most skilled intelligent actions. So, do, do, do you think these make sense, Shannon? These sort of the ideas that these things that these types are usually good at? Like, you know, ESDP at con artistry? <laughs> or being expedient? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does make sense. <laughs> Um, yeah, Banda really fits that role. Um, crafter, instrumenter. Ah, that's a, that, that's a good point that he's put it like that, rather than just as mechanic. Because people would say, oh, Kersey got into stereotypes. But when, he was in the era where you didn't have... Uh, nearly everyone in computing in his era was an NT. Now you've got everyone using... Um, Computers of nearly everyone, more representative of various types, using uh, computing. And you've got ISTPs using it as a tool, rather than the NTs in the early days using it for its own sake, with not so much of the practical benefit. Whereas you've got ISTPs like, I'm going to use this as a tool. A computer is a tool to get a job done, rather than something that's uh, overly abstract. Um, and then who is going to be the one to perfect it to make it uh, comfortable to use for the end user? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, with, with the way things work, they have all the beta testers. Oh, I'll tell you what happened with um, uh, Apple. It came out a f a f about eight years ago that Apple would have a load of people sign these non-disclosure agreements and they would be 
uh, received the iPhone before the iPhone came out. So they had all of this research so that they so that when it hit the market, it was very well. Its interface was very good because it had all of this testing from real people. Whereas a lot of products you get, say on a cooker, and it's like, hang on a minute, they've not thought that when you stood over it, you can't see the symbols just below. That it needs to be, because it's like they've not tested the products or done the market research. And so it made them sign the non-disclosure agreement. So when it came out, people were like, how did they know we wanted this? <laughs> there are lots of things like that. Uh, but yeah, the crafter. And also, as we know, ISDPs can also be quite five-ish. Because uh, generally it's like the IT is like, in different ways. It's, it's still mastery, though. So uh, you can have like ISTJs, ISDPs, and INTPs, and INTJs, generally the ones that are mostly five-ish. Uh, uh, do you, do you, could you think that the ESFP, the things that ESFP are good at, Shannon, do you think that's not a million miles away from, from you, that you got a little bit of that in you? You can sort of switch to that? Hmm. I guess that they do tend to synthesize. They're just more extroverted about it. So I, <laughs> I can see the jump. Maybe not so much in myself. But <laughs> yeah. Although you did some things that are younger, those extreme examples. Like, oh, that's pretty expressive. That's like the cat. Maybe the more counterphobic moments could be a little <laughs> bit more ESFB. Uh... Uh, what was it got here? Tactical role event. No skilled actions. Expediter. Right then, we we'll move uh, forward. So yeah, expediting again. To think of as oh, here we go. Yeah, expediency, improvising, flexibility versus principles. And author. So you can see how, from their point of view, if you're concerned with authenticity and principles, you can't be flexible. So it's like this is why Kersey thinks that not very many politicians at all have been nfs um D jeff you've been around for that discussion haven't you where they've talked about whether an, whether any american president has been an nf well yeah he said no presidents but not not that there's been no nf politicians there's yeah. there's been plenty but but i think nfs don't tend to last as long in politics usually as the other types because Politics is basically the art of lying most successfully, and NFs kind of have an aversion to that. Like, it starts to weigh on them if they have to do that very much. So. <laughs> I'm fed up of all this lying. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. So it's, you know, NFs are, they're not motivated by telling people what they want to hear to get elected. They want, they usually have, like, certain causes they believe in that they're like true believers to the cause and if the cause is popular at the time so it's getting a lot of support then they can get elected or get you know be that movement can be successful but then if it isn't uh then they're not going to change to something else to to, to fit with that they're going to stay true to what they are which so it means that they can often get disillusioned by the political process and I quit participating in it I think with quite a few NFs, it's almost as if that I can see them, that they believe their own rubbish. <laughs> because it's like on a political level, because it's like they believe in it. So they don't like convince themselves it can be true because they really want it to be true. But there's and been, so. you know, there's been some, there's been at least a few fairly successful long time NF politicians. Like I think. Yeah. Pretty sure that Kersey said that uh, that John Kerry was one, so that's an example. I mean, he was somebody that's been a, you know, was a senator for a long time and yeah, yeah. Was, was nominated just... for president, so he got that far. And... Yeah, the thing is just that a general trend amongst the very the very young, say NFPs, where they can be uh, idealistic, naive, and then uh, one of the reasons yeah. why. Yeah, I'd say it's more likely probably for NFJs to last longer in politics than NFPs. Yeah. On a general rule. 
you know, it's just that um, experience of the difference between the pragmatics, how reality is, and then idealism. And I suppose when they get older, they still have that idealism there, but they learn that there's a difference between the real world and the ideals. And it's sort of like they don't forget them. But it's like, okay, what is achievable now to get sort of that half of that idealistic loaf rather than being yeah. as rigid? I think often, um, often the NFs will be satisfied to be the ones sort of manipulating political movements rather than being the actual politicians like uh, Oprah Winfrey, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, the NFJ is a little bit tricky. <laughs> In the because uh, there's a little bit more personal ambition about them with the with some NFJs. Where it's like, yeah, but it, it still it still is in pursuit of a cause. It's yeah. Like, it doesn't mean they don't have huge egos along with it. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes it's almost as if they select the cause that also just happens to be very ad very advantageous for them as well. Yeah. The, the you know become very rich in the process with uh, Oprah, so yeah, they're not as uh, altruistic. As they, uh, no, but I think what yeah. you know, I think the, that type of ENFJ basically has to convince themselves that all of that is part of the same goal, though. Yes, that that's the, way, the thing. The way they achieve what they want to achieve is that part of it is they realize they're successful and popular at those things, and so that's part of it. It's like they're going to use that popularity and, and success to achieve what they want to achieve, and ah. yeah, part of it is continuing to remain top of mind center of the public's attention because they're like otherwise the cause will suffer if mm. i'm not always out there promoting myself so i so i suppose for enfj there's quite a lot of characteristics in common with enneagram two and three where it's like they want the acceptance and approval with the two and the success of the three and those things can like bleed together I suppose with the two way three. Um, right, so this these operator artisans, these are the STPs. The operator artisans are particularly interested in acting expediently, that is, in using whatever maneuvers or instruments it takes to advance their current enterprise or project. Oddly enough, the word expedient is derived from the activity of freeing a foot that is caught in a trap. X equals out, ped equals foot as in a, a pediatrician. I think that's right, or a podiatrist. Uh, pediatrician of children. Uh, uh. But the word has gradually come to suggest the clever moves of someone in a situation calling for... Thought it was a bit of wisdom there for Morgan. But the word has gradually come to suggest the clever moves of someone in a situation calling for timely tactics, mainly to increase chances of success and only rarely to decrease the possibility of failure. These tough minded operators are masters of the expedient use of anything that can be adapted to their immediate, immediate intentions, which is to say that they instinctively know where they must go and the fastest route to get there. These are also the directive SPs, which means that in order to get what they want, they are not at all shy about telling others what to do. I think that rings true, Shannon, for STPs that you've known. Yeah, I think that I'm thinking of one particularly at work where she will... Um, use things in the environment to not so much think about like somebody's going to need that later, but she'll <laughs> take it and use it and very quickly um, rearrange the entire environment and then tell, she'll direct people, do this, do this, do this, let's do this. And then it'll get done quickly. And then <laughs> later on, we're like, where's that? Where's the supplies? Oh yeah. We already used those. Yeah. And um, the NTJs can be similar, it's just that they think more about the consequences of that in the direct. So it's like, um, you gave an example, Kersey and personality of a business where um, ESTP would be the quickest to get rid of 
useless staff members from their point of view with but without so that they so so they can act so quickly no resistance is built up whereas entj would be a little bit more strategic about how to prune the staff so that whereas estp it might be oh i actually needed that guy after all <laughs> so <laughs> it's, 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 it's upsides and downsides speed of action where this operates so quickly no one can build up a resistance whereas the the ntj is again more strategic still adaptive but it's strategic so you can get that so sometimes they in business and they can look similar stps with ntjs and quite frequently you get that situation with say isdp and intj especially if it's like an int isdp5 they can look quite intj-ish and also intjs tend to admire some of the qualities of uh isdp you know, their ability to take risks and act in the moment, analyze the situation, and then act. Uh, oh, operators make their moves in two roles, acting either as an expressive promoter or the reserved crafter. And again, this is where you're getting a blend of type and role variant. And the more you perform a role, the more it feeds back into the person's skills. So Kersey would say is that the ESTP, when talking about it as a type, is naturally predisposed to this role. And then, as you know, the more somebody performs a certain role, the more that that role can then feed back onto them. Because Dario has certainly shown how education, career, and culture can affect the brain just as much as someone's natural type. So you will get this feedback from a nurture point of view but it, as we said earlier it depends what someone is predisposed to what they have a natural inclination or talent for uh, uh, promoters put boundless energy into persuading others to buy into their ventures let's make america great again <laughs> with all their charm doesn't really apply to him <laughs> with all their charm <laughs> this smooth operate did to jfk though with all their charm, these smooth operators, uh, more for Jeff K than Trump, as they are called, are well able to advertise, announce, boost, convince, entice, induce, lure, publicize, publish, proclaim, talk up, tempt, sway, and wheel and deal. Yeah, Trump once in a when he was given a uh, a speech after in a in a primary, what he did is he had all of his products on the side. He was like, here are the Trump steaks. And he started to promote his products in the middle of when he should have been talking about his campaign. So, <laughs> your Trump steaks. All of these might be thought as of tactical actions to advance the promoter's enterprises, be they in sales, property development. Oh, I wonder who he's thinking about. Politics show business production or industrial negotiation any occupation that calls for winning others confidence and so trump had a book called the art of the deal now apparently he didn't write it all it was sort of ghost written but i suppose his thought process came through so do you think that sounds true uh, shannon for estps or or is it something yeah. that they can do but they're not all get into that role i think it definitely sounds like trump yeah because <laughs> <laughs> then the other thing is more describing the role that they're predisposed to and then with crafters um let's see where we are right uh Crafters, on the other hand, um, crafters, on the other hand, focus on the tool, implement, mechanism, or instrument employed to get a job done. These quiet, often solitary operators know about and know how to use whatever instrument will effectively accomplish the task at hand. Action of this kind is tactical by its very nature, requiring awareness of those instruments and resources that are close by available and how they can be modified to serve the purpose no matter how they are conventionally defined or what their intended use. Thus, crafters, depending on their experience, 
can skillfully do such things as sail boats, do surgical procedures, drive race cars, handle power and hand tools, operate earth movers, forklifts and cranes, pilot aircraft, work gadgets, steer vehicles, wield weapons and so on. Their skills spreading across the ever widening spectrum of operant equipment. And then I sort of put there, includes computers from the 80s onwards. Before then, computers were very NT. So, Shannon, does that sound out of date? Is it still relevant? Is Kersey stuck in the 50s? <laughs> well, if I think about how I... I'm not, I'm not so much of a planner when it comes to using tools. Like, I don't think about, like, what would be the best tool for the job. I more think, I, I'm in a job, and I'm thinking, what tools around me can I use? Yeah. And I will improvise. Yeah, um, interestingly enough, Laura, whose sort of best fit type is INTP, she's self prayers Enneagram type 6, and she's talked about this publicly, and we're going to hang out on it, where she goes more by the book because she worries about getting in trouble. And doesn't want to get fired but when she's doing something on her own she's more adaptive and will do it her way so the enneagram can have an influence there where the six doesn't want to take as many risks because if it goes wrong they might get fired <laughs> uh, but yeah so so laura would have so it's like she would get mistyped as isfj but that's because, well, people aren't looking at the motivation, just looking at the actions. And it's just that her actions are for E6 reasons. Because, so for you, as somebody who resembles E6, do you want to fit in? How much of that is a part of you wanting to fit in? I definitely want to fit in with, with the as self-preservation instinct. I definitely want, don't want to get fired. So yeah. I want to fit in just enough that I'm always in good graces with my boss. Um, so uh. <laughs> she gives me a lot of leeway so I can, I can actually experiment. Um, I, I think that the safer I feel with authority or anything that I'm doing that has to do with authority, anything yeah. I'm doing where the outcome is being judged by an authority figure, um, the safer I feel, the more, if I had a different boss, I, I've had different bosses that were like, do it by the books and I yeah. would order the proper tools. I'd make sure I had everything I needed and do it by the procedure in their timeline. Yeah. But now it's like, if I can procrastinate and wait till the last minute, I'm going to do that more and use whatever tools are around me. Right. Right. So you can see there you've got the difference between the behavior and the preference. Well, preference is to do it, so go with your artisan tendencies, whereas before you're sort of forced to do it more by the book. And so yeah. some, somebody looking with a drive-by type and would go, oh, Shannon, she's by the book. Yes, but why is she by the book? In that in, in that situation, you got to look for the preference. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, operant equipment. Uh, then we got the role, and of course, uh, the the um, in terms of so in terms of there's this thing of preference, and then how hard it is to perform certain roles. So as I mentioned before, very hard for. INTP is to do the ESTJ no. role of supervisor. Uh, right, so now we're on the SFPs, or rather, the roles that the SSPs are good ones. Yes, the oh, ones they are predisposed to. The, the roles that they are, have a natural inclination uh, for. Good although, stuff, man. No, man. And, and, and Jeff doesn't do this professionally, right. but he does the tries to enact this role in small ways. Um, other artisans are drawn toward improvising works of entertainment, and these friendly, informative entertainers are able to use effortlessly, effortlessly whatever materials they find to wing it. 
to play it by ear, to fly by the seat of their pants, to make things up as they go along, are far more comfortable sharing their creations with others than directing their actions. Like operators, entertainers have the tactical ability to notice every sensual detail of their surroundings and to react spontaneously, adapting something on the spot, on the spur of the moment. They can hit upon ways of utilizing what's at hand to suit their current artistic intention, and they can do this without pre-planning. In other words, their style is to jerry-build or jury-rig um, things in front of them rather than to pre-configure and devise things out of the blue. So NTP is pre-configure and devise things, so more like the INTP. Uh, the latter is called engineering. Yeah, that corresponds to NTP is an activity requiring NT strategic rather than SP tactical intelligence. It is true, however, that improvising and engineering resemble each other in that both are methods of construction. However, entertainers use creatively whatever bits and scraps of material are actually present and immediately available, whereas engineers envision and build whatever components are necessary for a system to operate as designed. So there's a little difference there in emphasis of NTPs. We need these things to fit this plan, whereas with STPs, it's, okay, what can I do out of what is present? So it's uh, one of the, I suppose a little bit more, I suppose an example would be, uh, I don't know if Belichick's an NNT, but maybe fitting the players to the team rather than uh, fitting the players to the system, which is maybe a bit more NT, rather than fitting the system to the players that you've got, which might be a bit more SP. Do you think that's more the case, Jeff? Or is it a, a yeah, general to a point? Yeah, because yeah. I think um, you have you definitely have coaches that have been like, um, well, I've got to change the system, um, you know, to fit what I have available to me. Yeah, there's some of both. I mean, yeah, coaches don't like to deviate too much from their way of doing things, but because they you know believe it's what they're good at, but uh. But yeah, you definitely have. I've definitely heard some times where the commentators were talking about it. Uh, well, a good example, I guess, would be uh, John Robinson when he was coach of the LA Rams back in the you know '80s and early '90s. Because when he had Eric Dickerson, they were very much a run-first team. And then after mm. uh, uh, he got Jim Everett as quarterback, kind of re-envisioned uh, things, and the offense became much more of a passing offense. And they traded Dickerson, and so they completely change their priorities on offense but based on who the players available were yeah and so the smarter ones of, of, of any temperament it's like they've got their predisposition but then they can be flexible and, and, and they've learned from experience and we did a hangout on this with giardello where he learned to give his artisan detectives their head and but whenever they got stuck he would you'd go we'll do this 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 and this just learning from experience. Uh, uh, so, yeah, because he definitely had ideas about you know this is the right and wrong way to do things, but uh, he also knew that the ultimate goal was close as many cases as possible, <laughs> because his bosses, you know, the authority that he trusted as a guardian, they're the ones telling him this is what you got to do. So he's like, well, this is what I have to accomplish. This is what I have to get people under me to accomplish. And I'm going to allow them some leeway in the methods in which they accomplish that because the ultimate goal is achieved. I mean, there can be some similarities with NTs and SJs in that, say, I've heard it with Belichick that he will fit players who aren't necessarily stars, but they're, they're perfect fit to fit into his system. Yeah. Uh, so you can get that with NTs, but I can also think that you could also get to that same result with SJs. It's like, this is the way we're playing, and we need the people to fit this. But I suppose it's more with the SJs is it won't be their own system that they've come up with. It will be like, oh, this guy that I, this guy used this system, so I'm going to use this system, whereas the NTs will sort of come up with their own system and then fit people 
to it, especially NTJs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I talked about Phil Jackson earlier. He definitely did that with, you know, the Bulls and the Lakers, and he had, you know, uh, it sounds simple, but, you know, the way that they ran the offense where it was like throw it into the big guy and then when he gets double teamed, throw it out to the outside shooter who hits a three-pointer, you know, he was more effective at finding guys that filled those roles and, and a lot of people, you know, in terms of it doesn't matter whether the guy who catches the pass and shoots from outside uh, is somebody that scores 25, 30 points a game as a star or whatever. It just matters they can hit the shot in that moment that they need to. They can hit that one shot. So one shot. Uh, he would shuffle people in and out of those roles because it was like whoever was the hot shooter, <laughs> you know, who had the high percentage shot from there, well, he'd stick that guy in there. And if right. he's making them, then he's filling that role effectively. Makes sense. And Especially with the Lakers, because you know it was it was a lot about like Shaquille O'Neal was the guy in the middle, so it was like, well, we run the offense through him, and the fact that we give the ball to him, and first allow him to have a chance to score. But if he's getting uh, double team, triple team, fouled over and over again, you know, whatever, where he's not scoring, then we got to have guys he can throw it to that are going to be able to hit the shot from outside. So, yeah, it's not one of the things in the Super Bowl where. The one with the, the Bears and the uh, Patriots where they concentrated so much on stopping uh, Walter Payton that they actually got beaten through the air against the Bears. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, Jeff, do you want to read this bit about performers? Because then you can stop and comment on it because you're talking about your people. Uh, performers improvise in front of others and so they get good at demonstrating, displaying, showing, presenting, staging, and acting or exhibiting their artistic skills. Putting on a show for others to watch with pleasure is an extraordinarily demanding task. The most obvious examples of virtuoso performers are, of course, the great artisan. He's crossed out the word. I can't read it. Yes, it's show players. <laughs> no, what does it actually say? Oh, actors. Okay. Yeah. Artisan actors, singers, dancers, and comedians. But these outgoing entertainers also excel in less glamorous occupations in retail sales, real estate, elementary and secondary teaching, public relations, politics, wherever skillfully handling an audience is part of the job description. So, yeah, that's another place where um, where I feel like he's, uh, he's shutting up the people who say that it's all about stereotypes because he's yeah. saying, obviously, yeah. that not every ESFP is a professional entertainer and certainly not a famous professional <laughs> entertainer because there's not enough of those for the amount of people that are ESFPs in the world. So they obviously have to be uh, in a lot of other occupations and, and that aren't as well known. So, yeah. Um, and I, of course, relate to that as one who is a not well-known ESFP. <laughs> Ben's even, like, um, like tripled my subscribers by now, I think, maybe. At least double <laughs> on my YouTube channel. So, yeah, it's But like, he's been at... constantly <laughs> uploading content, and I haven't. So there you go. Yeah. But anyway... Um, uh, yeah, so obviously there's a lot of other there's a lot of ways that you can perform, so to speak, that are not necessarily show business, but you just again find those opportunities to use the talents you do have, the the and what you enjoy doing to help you excel at how you do it. Uh, you know, it mentioned retail sales. I'm sure there's plenty of um, car salesmen yeah. that are ESFPs. Just because I can't stand them doesn't mean that a lot of them are effective <laughs> at, at uh, selling cars by performing, you know. Yeah. Uh, I've seen that with Only Fools and Horses where you have these two characters where you've got Del Boy who's ESFP, where it's more about the performance. And then you've got Boyce who's ESTP. And like the, the difference between the two of them where it's, I suppose with the ESTP, it's more about getting the sale. And maybe the ESFP, like... Well, it's very close in that there's not really going to be that many. Maybe a little bit more on the performance with ESFP. Like if they're if they're a fly pitcher and they're selling something out of a suitcase, and it's just like being entertaining all of the people around them with their uh, sales shtick kind of thing. Whereas whereas ESTP might go more for the manipulation. Or the, 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 the sort of things you more associate with sales tactics, 
course, it's going to depend on the individual. But yeah, I mean, uh, both can use similar tactics. It's just with ASFPs, it's a little bit more about they relish a little bit more of the actual performance itself. Maybe you know, yeah. you can get thrilled. Like if if I feel like you know I perform this well, then the, getting the sale is just a bonus. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the thing. I had fun doing it, even if I didn't make a sale. And I think you said like you take these little opportunities to perform, like things that you've done on the phone. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, yeah, I used to when I was uh, one of the when I was still working in in the restaurants. I used to um, I used to make up different names, you know, because uh, like for instance, uh, I was we were supposed to like say you know the location of the restaurant, you know, like if it was. Well, Subway, then, you know, this particular location was Woodstone. And I would say, you know, thanks for calling Woodstone Subway. This is Rodrigo. Can I help you? You know, just make up a different name. <laughs> Which was funny when we get people calling, like, uh, our manager's wife. Because <laughs> she knew it was me. And she'd be like, oh, Rodrigo. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, oh maybe you, you went... I don't know if you went as far as this is Fabio. <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's dumb. Yes, okay. <laughs> I picked names that sounded good then. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, I remember when Fabio was a huge hit with the ladies in the 90s. <laughs> this yeah. guy with long hair. Um, I remember this, you tell this great, this, this good thing that you used to do where, but it was sort of like within your ethics where you would like, on online uh, type forums, you would um, answer questions uh, um, from the point of view of another type, but everything you answered was still truthful. I remember mm -hmm. that was Yeah, quite... I did that on Typology Central because there was like very few SJ types there, and there was like a... there were topics like ask a whatever type. And so I started the one that was asking ESFJ because no e actual ESFJ had done so. So I never claimed I was an ESFJ, but I, I just said, I just started the topic the way all the others did and answered the questions when people asked them because I, this is like, I can answer some things, but, you know, without saying that I'm an ESFJ, which I never did. But I like the fact that you, you wanted to, and almost make, probably to make it more interesting and more of a challenge, that everything you said had to be true. That come from yeah, another experience. thing I did is um, when uh, the, the associated with that, there was a, vo a voice chat on uh, Ventrilo where, um, you know, at, at, for a time you didn't have to come in as like your registered name. You could, you know, call yourself whatever. Uh, so one thing I did was, you know, I'd make up some name like very polite cow, for instance. Um, <laughs> and people in there were always like, you know, especially the <laughs> NF types were always trying to like type people, you know, by based on what they said. So they'd like ask me questions and I would answer them. Uh, but again, it was like I would tell the truth, but I would still I sort of emphasize certain things that might sort of lean them in a certain direction as to what type they would think I was. And the funny thing was that even when doing that, there were still people that would get it right eventually. Like there were people that were sharp enough in terms of uh, because they went for what the core preferences really are as opposed to going off of stereotypes or things that just sort of give you like, oh, I got this feeling from what you say, like this sounds, you know, uh, in T-ish or whatever the thing would be, you know, rather than, and especially this is the thing is people jump to those things when, when somebody is like argumentative and they'll go, <laughs> oh, that person must be an NT because they're arguing with everything. <laughs> like, no. Yeah. <laughs> like there's people that are like, no, you wouldn't have been like so like jumping on people's words and nitpicking their words and arguing with it if you if you weren't an NT. It's like, uh, no, that's you're mistaken. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it might be the SJ is frustrated with another example of the education system <laughs> going yeah, to the dog right. society. There's, there's a lot of different ways to uh, it's like that. That's why I. I try to get across to most of people when it comes to any of these discussions. If, if there's one thing people would get, if nothing else, it's that anybody of any type can take the exact same actions as, as somebody of a different type <clears throat> for different reasons. Oh, so wow. if you just I, go yeah. based on the actual action itself, 
it does not automatically tell you uh, a person's type. Yes, it can maybe hint at certain things. There's maybe more types that are more likely to take a specific action, but it doesn't tell you that alone because the motivation for doing that action could be entirely different. And then I suppose it's looking at not just the particular action, but the pattern of actions. Do they consistently right. take these actions? Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing is, is why this is difficult when you're talking about people that either those that try to type famous people or those that try to type people that they only encounter in a certain environment, like people they work with or, um, you know, or people you know, that they play basketball with or whatever the thing is. It's like if the only time you ever encounter that person is that environment, you're seeing the way they are in that environment, but you don't necessarily know how they are in other environments. So it only gives you a, a small picture of the person and so that person might come across entirely differently in a, if you encountered them in a different environment so that's the thing that i always sort of err on the side of caution like you know i'm not going to say i never do any drive-by typings like some people do where i sort of get an idea oh this person's probably this but i don't put a lot of stake in it until i have more evidence or more information about really what makes that person tick outside of just that one context yeah, they're core cool motivators, why they do the thing. Um, so uh, on this one, with uh, composers, so the role that ISFPs are predisposed to, composers use their talents to fashion pleasurable works rather than to stage shows for others, often working alone. Alone, <laughs> often working alone. <laughs> the reserved entertainers make arrangements, combinations, groupings, mixtures, and the like exercising their improvisational skills by spotting parts or ingredients and then fitting them together into pleasing forms. So it's a little bit like there's some parallels between this and INTP where you can figure in models and putting aspects together, but on more of an abstract level than this concrete level, because you've got that parallel between composing and designing. Um, the most obvious examples of virtuosity in this synthesizing process are some of the great musical components, composers, but skilled composers excel in all aesthetic endeavors, painting, choreography, directing films, writing songs, poems or novels, cooking, fashion designing, interior decorating, landscaping, perfumery, which I found particularly amusing, any occupation calling for the attentive blending of sight, sounds, tastes, textures or smells. So Shannon, your comments on that. Are well, you into perfumery? <laughs> actually, <laughs> yes, I do, I do blend essential oils together. Um, use those as perfume, depending on how I'm feeling that day. Yeah. Yep. There you go. That's very artisan-y. Uh, <laughs> when I'm cooking, um, sometimes all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, this needs something. And I'll be like, oh, what can I grab real quick that resembles whatever texture or flavor that I want it to add to it. Like at the last minute, I'll just throw something in. Yep. So, I mean, how yeah, one example I think of uh, for me is, um, uh, again, back to working in restaurants, but uh, I would often like combine all of the different sauces and dressings we had uh, into like one <laughs> super sauce. <laughs> and that I could like, you know, like when I was at McDonald's, I did that with all of the dressings and sauces we had in the back of McDonald's and used it as a nugget dipping sauce. So, you know. The super sauce. And I would work on it, you know, because it was like, if it didn't taste right, I'm like, oh, it's a little too much of, you know, like when I figured out one thing, uh, tartar sauce, you know, goes a long way. You have to only put a little bit of that because if you put too much, it takes over the whole sauce. In the right yeah, so I had to work on over time, like getting uh, the, the right mix, so you know that it tasted the best. Good. Uh, let's go. So, but, but, but these particular things, um, how do you think you are? I mean, I think you said you do dance as well, Shannon. But these particular things, how good are you at generally at these? Some of these things listed here as these endeavors. Um, how good am I? Like. Um, well, I think that I'm really good at a lot of like poetry, writing, 
Yeah. Um, landscaping. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I, I do it for myself and I don't want to be seen. I, I write under pen names. And yeah. I don't necessarily want to put my things out to the world. Um, but I ha have so much fun doing these things, and, and I think I am good at it. Because yeah, you mentioned dancing before, so you sort of incline towards quite a few of these things. The choreography thing, painting, all these. Yeah, I love choreography. I, I started dancing when I was very young. Right. Um, I was on, on figure skates at age three, and then ballet and tap at age five, and then dancing throughout my childhood, and then with cheerleading and dance in high school, and then beyond. Um, I could care less about the audience. Right. I just really like right. the, the act about, of doing it. Yeah, I was about to ask that. Yeah, but ESFP, it might be like people seeing them doing it, whereas ISFP enjoying it. Um, Jeff, I was always the first one out on a dance floor, and even if I was the only one out there, I, di I didn't care. Right. Like, that's something that didn't matter. I'm always out there dancing. Um, Jeff, you once made a, a good point about, I think you, maybe you were talking about Paul McCartney or somebody else, uh, to sort of tell the difference between ESFP and ISFP. I think you said that a musician played towards a particular person in the audience. Oh, yeah, actually, it was uh, John Bon Jovi. Yeah, he, he talked about how the way he did uh, concerts, he always, like, you know, would focus on a particular person in the audience, and it was like, pretend like he was singing just to them, and that nobody else was there. So that struck me as a really ISFP thing, <laughs> you know, that that would be, whereas, you know, in contrast, somebody like uh, Tommy Lee from Motley Crue, who I think is an ESFP, who said that, like, he wanted... To, for the crowd to be like so loud he just heard like this you know like reverberation of, uh, of the noise like in his ears or like so it was more about the maximum amount of people and a maximum amount of like feedback at the same time you it's... know whereas john bon jovi was like uh, the way i deal with this giant crowd is pretending like i'm singing to this one person but not like the same person for the entire right. concert you know he would switch it and then go to somebody else but it was like he's still focused on it's like i'm singing to this person for this part so the Mot Motley Crue guy you mentioned, is he ESF more ESFP or ESDP? I think he's an F, but, you know. Right. Yeah. In fact, I think that's why, uh, uh, like, he, he and Vince Neil, the lead singer, I think they had a lot of conflicts during the time that they were in the band together, and I think Vince Neil's probably an ESTP, and so most of the conflicts that they described were kind of related to that difference, I think. Because Tommy was, you know, usually more about just... You know, he wanted to have fun and enjoy the experience. And, uh, you know, Vince had more, I don't know, some other other ideas or other goals or whatever that sometimes conflicted. So he actually would say that Tommy wasn't taking things seriously enough sometimes. Mm. Right. Um, comparing the tactical role variants. While every artisan plays these four roles with skill, they do not play them all with equal skill. What distinguishes artisans from one another is the structure of their intellect, their profile of tactical roles. Some operators, for instance, that's SDPs, are better as promoters of enterprises, like Trump, while others are better as crafters manipulating instruments, even though persuading and instrumenting skills often go hand in hand. Just so, some entertainers are better as performers putting on shows, while others are better as composers of works, even though performers are often successful at composing and composers often perform their own works with great skill. To get a clearer picture of the differences in likely tactical development among the artisans, let us consider the following chart. And uh, likely development. So you've got this, a little bit of a, an overlap here between uh, vocation and social role in someone's predisposition so oh there we go yeah that's kind of what i was talking about earlier when when i was talking about sort of the secondary uh role or whatever the, 
you know, whatever that you have your tallest ones, then you have your second tallest one. Yeah. And also these things, they're actually opposite in, this is something in the bars, these opposite in interaction style. So promoter is expressive and directive and composer is reserved and informer. Whereas what they have in common with the crafter is being directive and what they have in common with the performer is uh, being expressive. So they have nothing in common well, amongst it, furthest in common with the uh, composer. Now, in terms of functions, you would say ESTP, FI break, ISFP, FI lead, that sort of clashing uh, there. Um, Oh yeah, and the composer, it's the, the like they, they are the least good at, say, the Donald Trump promoting kind of thing. You know, there um, are other ESTPs besides Donald Trump, I just want Yes, to... <laughs> yes. Um, who shall we mention? But, you know, references for audiences. If you want to help, so who should I mention there, Jeff, for ESTP? Who do you think that the audience will know? Uh, Indiana Jones. <laughs> Oh, was it Kanye West? <laughs> yeah, I don't know enough about him to know what his type is. But... Yeah. He, you probably don't want to let him into the SP <laughs> club. No, um, I mean, it's not that. I just don't know enough about him. Uh, okay, He's probably enough. an SP, but I just don't. Yeah. I couldn't say which one exactly or why, because no. you know, I don't uh -huh. know. Garbage SPs. Yeah. <laughs> Morgan said there's tons of garbage SPs, so <laughs> it's not a... We don't have that same thing. Like the NTs are more particular. Like they don't want to let people in the club. But, uh, oh yeah, like, <laughs> like David Marks like that. If you're religious, yeah, <laughs> right. You can't be, can't be religious, or you know, even be like you. Like I said earlier about Phil Jackson. Like it, you know, it, just because he was like uh, using these things didn't even mean he was necessarily believed in it, quote unquote. Like he didn't. I don't even remember Phil Jackson yeah. ever calling himself a Buddhist. <laughs> he just used the principles to to effectively uh, manipulate people to win basketball games. Yeah, I think that's part of that. But I, I, there might also be a little NI thing in there. Of, I mentioned that earlier. But on. yeah, but that's why he also said he didn't think he thought C.S. Lewis couldn't be an NT that he was an NF because he was, you know, he's, he became this uh, prominent Christian writer. So you know, <laughs> but if you look at his arguments, his whole thing is his focused on convincing people with logic, right? As to do with feelings. Yeah. So, so uh, it's actually quite frequent that INTJs are religious because it's sort of that weird NI thing. I always thought describe NI as weird. It's like that belief and that commitment, this belief that it is right and they can't quite explain why. Sometimes I have that feeling of that something's right. Um, uh, conviction. Note that promoters, ESTPs, and composers are mirror images of each other as are crafters and performers. Thus, the promoters are usually ready, willing, and able to take up their enterprises while they are less inclined to fashion works of art. The reverse holds for the composers, who are likely to create entertaining works with increasing energy while they would find it more difficult to boost enterprises. Just so, the crafters are quite willing and able to run all sorts of machinery but less so to stage a performance. And last, the performers are the best of all in putting on a show of some kind, though not the best at operating tools. And uh, I don't know why I found that funny. However, even with their long and short suits, artisans will tend to practice and thus will develop any one of these four tactical roles well above those strategic, logistical, and diplomatic roles of the other types. Uh, complete portraits of the four artisan role variants can be found at the end of this chapter, beginning on page 63. It must be said that tactical intelligence in any of its forms is so much more observable than the other kinds. Do you think that's true, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I mean, probably... Yeah, probably the most. Uh, not that any, the others can't be observable, but it's you know because it's just more in the moment, in the yeah. in your face. You know, sometimes not always. Yeah. Um, strategic, logistical, and diplomatic intelligence, if observable at all, are hard to see or hear for what they are.
but not tactical intelligence, shouting as it does into our ears and parading itself before our eyes so that we cannot help noticing it. Think about it. Who are the most famous artists, entertainers, athletes, warriors, politicians, and entrepreneurs? All visibly persons of effective action, if not artisans. Right then, I think that is yes. We've gone through yeah. all yeah. of the all That's of good the timing side. too, because uh, Texas Tech basketball game is about to start in a few minutes. So okay, so then because I heard you uh, doing your drum roll kind of thing with tapping your fingers. So Shannon, after going through that, what do you think of all this crazy business? A load of nonsense that's stuck in the fifties, or does he have some truth contained in there? I think it's very applicable. It makes me want to study it now. It, it makes sense to me. Yeah. It's like I would love I would love to layer the Kersey and what I know of the Enneagram. Yeah. Yeah, we did a hangout on that. With the the the, um, the, the tenth one with Catherine Farver. It was like four hours long, and I sort of like <laughs> overindulged myself, like talking about the connections between Enneagram and. Uh, temperament right there so i can i will stop the broadcast and then we can continue for a bit so right. uh, bye everybody bye